Hello everyone, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be discussing solutions and in this chapter we're going to explore the following objectives. Objective one is titled Nature of Solutions. Here we're going to discuss salvation, solubility, and aqueous solutions. These foundational concepts are really important for understanding how substances interact and dissolve in solvents. Then our second objective discusses concentration. Here we're going to learn about different units of concentration like molarity and molality. And we're also going to discuss the process of dilution and its practical applications. Then our third objective explores the effects of temperature and pressure on solubility. And then last but certainly not least, our final objective is going to cover colligative properties. We're going to go over Raoul's law, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure. Now that we understand our goals for this chapter, let's go ahead and get started. Now, many important chemical reactions, both in lab and in nature, they occur in solutions, including nearly all biological processes. Solutions are homogeneous mixtures where two or more substances combine to form a single phase, typically a liquid phase. And while this class emphasizes solids dissolved in aqueous solutions, it's also important to remember that solutions can form from any combination of the three phases of matter. Now, given the prominence of water, in many solutions we're going to study, it's important that we discuss water before we dive into the components of solutions. Water is one of the most important substances on Earth. It's essential for sustaining the reactions that keep us alive, but it also affects our lives in many indirect ways. And one of the most valuable properties of water is its ability to dissolve many different substances. Now, to understand this, we need to consider the nature of water. Liquid water consists of a collection of H2O molecules. Now, an individual H2O molecule is bent-shaped or V-shaped, with this hydrogen-oxygen-hydrogen -hydrogen angle being approximately 105 degrees. Now, the hydrogen-oxygen-hydrogen -hydrogen bonds in the water molecule are covalent bonds that are formed by electron sharing between the oxygen atom and the hydrogen atoms. However, the electrons of these bonds, they're not shared equally between these atoms. Oxygen is more electronegative. It enjoys electrons a little bit more than hydrogens, so it pulls those electrons a little bit more towards itself. And this results in a partially negative charge associated with the oxygen and a partially positive charge associated with the hydrogens. And so again, this is really important because this unequal charge distribution results in water being a polar molecule. And it is this polarity that gives water its great ability to dissolve compounds. Now, water molecules are also known for their strong intermolecular attractions. These attractions occur between the slightly negative oxygen atom of one water molecule and the slightly positive hydrogen atom of another water molecule. And this unique interaction is called hydrogen bonding. This is a type of dipole-dipole attraction. And it is this strong hydrogen bonding, again, that gives water its unique properties, such as its high heat capacity and its ability to act as a solvent for many different substances. Now, besides water molecules interacting with other water molecules, these polar water molecules also interact with the positive and negative ions of salt, and this assists in the dissolving process. Please note here that the positive ends of the water molecules are going to be attracted to the negatively charged anions, and the negative ends of the water molecules are attracted to the positively charged cations. And this process is called hydration. 
Okay, so think about it. What if we dissolve an ionic compound in water? Well, the hydration of its ions tends to cause a salt to fall apart in the water or to dissolve. The strong forces that are present among the positive and negative ions of the solid are replaced by the strong water-ion interactions. Of course, it's important to point out here that the solubility of ionic substances in water varies greatly. So for example, sodium chloride is quite soluble in water, whereas silver chloride is only very slightly soluble. The differences in the solubilities of ionic compounds in water typically depends on the relative attractions of the ions for each other versus the attractions of the ions for water molecules. And we're going to get into that in a lot more detail in this chapter. But essentially, understanding these properties of water sets the stage for exploring solutions and the chemical reactions that occur within them. So let's move into discussing the components of solutions now, the solute and the solvent. Again, a solution is a homogeneous mixture containing two or more substances. In any solution, the solute is the substance that is dissolved, while the solvent is the substance in which the solute is dissolved in. The solvent typically determines the phase of the solution. Now, solute molecules, they move about freely in the solvent and they interact with it through various intermolecular forces like ion dipole, dipole dipole, or hydrogen bonding. And these interactions allow dissolved solute molecules to interact not only with the solvent, but also with other dissolved molecules of different chemical identities. And that helps facilitate chemical reactions in solutions. Now, to that point, solvation is the electrostatic interaction between solute and solvent molecules, also known as dissolution. Now, when water acts as that solvent, this process is termed hydration. We just discussed this. But solvation is really important to conceptualize. Solvation involves breaking intermolecular interactions between solute molecules and between solvent molecules, and then forming new intermolecular interactions between solute and solvent molecules. And this process is crucial ultimately for understanding how substances dissolve and interact in solutions. So when the new interactions are stronger than the original ones, then solvation is exothermic and the process is gonna be favored at low temperatures. And when the new interactions are weaker than the original ones, then solvation is endothermic, and the process is favored at high temperatures. Sometimes the overall strength of the new interactions is approximately equal to the overall strength of the original interactions. In this case, the overall enthalpy change for the dissolution is close to zero, and these types of solutions approximate the formation of an ideal solution for which the enthalpy of dissolution is equal to zero. Now, the next thing we want to discuss is solubility. Solubility is a measure of how much solute can be dissolved in a given amount of solvent at a specific temperature. So it represents the maximum concentration of a solute that can be achieved in a solvent under given conditions. Now, solubility depends on various factors, including temperature, pressure, and the nature of both the solute and the solvent. And we're going to get into that in objective three. But for now, let's cover the types of solutions based on solubility. The first kind of solution we want to discuss is a unsaturated solution. An unsaturated solution is one in which the solute concentration is less than its maximum solubility at a given temperature and pressure. What this means is that more solute can be dissolved in the solvent without reaching the limit of solubility. So the solution has not yet reached its capacity to hold the solute. 
Now, what about saturated solutions? A saturated solution that contains the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in the solvent at a specific temperature and pressure. So that means any additional solute added is not going to dissolve and it's going to remain undissolved in the solution. So at this point, the solution is in a dynamic equilibrium where the rate of dissolution of the solute equals the rate of crystallization or precipitation of the solute. And then last, we can discuss supersaturated solutions. So a supersaturated solution contains more solute than what can typically be dissolved in the solvent at a given temperature and pressure. And this state is achieved by dissolving the solute at a higher temperature and then slowly cooling the solution without disturbing it. Supersaturated solutions, they're metastable, meaning they can precipitate the excess solute rapidly if they're disturbed or if a seed crystal is introduced. Now, when we're discussing solutions and solubility, it's important to understand how different solutes behave when they're dissolved in solvents, particularly in water. This behavior can be categorized based on the solute's ability to dissociate into ions, and that leads to their classification as either a strong electrolyte, a weak electrolyte, or a non-electrolyte. So let's define these. Let's start with discussing strong electrolytes. Strong electrolytes are substances that completely dissociate into ions when they're dissolved in water. And this complete ionization allows the solution to conduct electricity very efficiently. Now, what are examples of strong electrolytes? This includes strong acids, strong bases, and salts. So for example, ionic compounds like sodium chloride and potassium hydroxide, as well as strong acids like hydrochloric acid and sulfuric acid are all examples of strong electrolytes. Now, the high solubility of these compounds in water, again, leads to complete dissociation. That means that the solution contains a high concentration of free ions. And I wanna make this connection. This characteristic is what makes strong electrolytes good conductors of electricity in solution. Now, this is in contrast to weak electrolytes. Weak electrolytes only partially dissociate in water. This partial ionization means that the solution contains both ions and intact molecules. And so that results in a lower electrical conductivity compared to strong electrolytes. Examples of weak electrolytes are weak acids, like acetic acid, and weak bases, like ammonia. Now, although weak electrolytes dissolved in water do not fully ionize, the degree of dissociation depends on the equilibrium between the ionized and non-ionized form, and this is different for different molecules and compounds. Now, there's also the category of non-electrolytes. Non-electrolytes are substances that do not dissociate into ions at all, when they're dissolved in water. And so as a result, the, these solutions, they do not conduct electricity. So things that are non-electrolytes are organic compounds like sugar and also alcohols. So sugars and alcohols are common examples of non-electrolytes. Wonderful. Now that we understand these different categories, strong electrolyte, weak electrolyte, non-electrolyte, it's important for us to learn how to distinguish between them. And this is where our solubility rules are going to be really important. They're summarized in this table. I always recommend that you commit this kind of information to memory. It will help you succeed in your general chemistry course. Let's go ahead and go over this table together. This table has two categories, soluble ionic compounds 
and insoluble ionic compounds. Let's go over soluble ionic compounds first. Rule number one, group one cations, lithium, sodium, potassium, so on and so forth, always soluble. Ammonium, also always soluble. Anions like nitrate and acetate also are water soluble. Now the halides, specifically chloride, bromide, and iodide, excluding fluorides, they're also soluble with the exceptions of those formed with silver, lead, mercury, or copper. In addition, all salts of the sulfate ion are also soluble with the exceptions of those formed with calcium, strontium, barium, silver, or lead. Let's make it to this next category, insoluble ionic compounds. First thing to keep in mind here is that all metal oxides are insoluble with the exception of those formed with alkali metals and alkaline earth metals as well. But there's only a couple of those, calcium, strontium, and barium. And also ammonium. In addition to that, Carbonate and phosphate, insoluble except when they're paired with a group one cation or ammonium. Last, we have sulfides. They're insoluble with the exception of those formed with group one and group two cations and ammonium. So those are the rules we want to keep in mind here for soluble ionic compounds and insoluble ionic compounds. Now, considering everything we've discussed thus far, a question you should be asking yourself is, well, what is the driving force in the formation of solutions? In other words, why are some substances soluble in a particular solvent while others are not? And that's something we're going to get into in the next video. So I hope this was helpful thus far. Please make sure to watch the next video for the answer to that question. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.